It's an important question because we know from other settings, um, particularly from World War II, that when a university or a country loses uh, scientists, so if they go abroad, um, it's really hard to recover from that loss of human capital. And then, um, you know, those researchers, when they leave, um, they're not contributing, right, to, to knowledge being produced. They're also not training the next generation of researchers. So um, it's a real, um, you know, kind of negative impact on the country and its institutions. And so, um, you know, one thing that I've um, been involved in is, is thinking about policies that can counteract those negative impacts. I'm Ina Ganguly. Um, I'm a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I think that high-skilled immigration um, and like mobility of scientists is really um, the, one of the most important things behind scientific progress and innovation. And the reason is because I think science today and innovation, it's so international. So uh, international collaboration is a really big feature. Uh, but if we look at kind of the most important scientific breakthroughs and advances in kind of many areas, you can look at health, you can look at AI, energy, um, a lot of those innovations and, and scientific breakthroughs are um, are done by scientists who have moved across countries. And so one um, great example, I think, that's very recent for many of us, um, is um, the case of uh, Catalin Carrico. So she's um, a scientist who won the Nobel Prize in 2023. And she uh, immigrated to the US from Hungary and she uh, worked on the development of um, the mRNA technology for many years as a scientist. And that ultimately led to the development of the COVID vaccine, which, uh, as we know, you know, was a really important um, you know, innovation <laughs> you know, that um, helped save many, you know, many, many lives and really helped you know, society. And so there's many examples like that. Um, if you look at kind of different measures like um, highly, the most highly cited scientists or uh, Nobel Prize winners, um, if you look at um, you know, those groups of kind of really successful scientists and innovators, um, a lot of them are you know, from other countries, but came uh, particularly to the US to do their groundbreaking work. So it's really a big feature of, of how science uh, is done. Um, I have some uh, research where um, we looked at um, IIT uh, graduates. So this is the Indian uh, Institutes of Technology. Um, and we had um, a data set of um, people who were taking the entrance exam for this kind of very prestigious network of, of engineering colleges in, in India. And what we showed is that um, students who did really well on this exam, so we looked at, um, for example, the top 100 or the top 1,000, and if you look at the top 100, so these are really kind of the people who did uh, you know, really well. Almost you know, over 60% of these students um, came um, to later to study in the US for graduate school. And if we look then at kind of you know, in the US who are uh, kind of some of the top business leaders, entrepreneurs, actually many of them are graduates of the IITs. And so um, you know, the point is that migration really characterizes um, you know, science, innovation, business, um, kind of this movement, especially of kind of top talent is a big feature of I think how, um, you know, how innovations are, are happening. For example, one of the um, you know, kind of business leaders today, so CEO of uh, Alphabet, you know, the Google uh, parent company, Sundar Pichai, he is one example that he graduated from um, an IIT and so was one of these kind of, you know, Top um, top students from India, and so you know he's not the only one. There's many cases of this, and so um, you know migration, particularly you know from India and China in recent years. You know we've had a kind of a lot of um, you know scientists, um, engineers, um, you know particularly from these countries that have contributed a lot to to U.S. innovation and entrepreneurship. The one thing that um, I've studied uh, a lot is um, migration after the end of the Soviet Union. So, um, you know, during the Cold War period, um, there actually was, you know, very little mobility across kind of, you know, the, you know, the, the countries, um, the former Soviet Union, um, the U.S. and Europe. And so you can think of that as kind of an extreme where you have these pretty big barriers um, to mobility. Now, science was happening in both countries. We had, you know, the space race, you know, a lot of innovation happening, um, but people weren't moving across the countries. Um, and so one thing that I studied is that, you know, after the end of the Soviet Union, you had a lot of scientists um, come from, um, you know, Russia, other former Soviet republics come to the U.S., to different parts of the U.S. And, um, 
one thing I studied in this paper, um, ideas in immigration, um, you know, what Russian scientists brought to the U.S., um, is that the immigrants um, were really important um, Tra you know, uh, they were really important in transferring knowledge. So when they came to the U.S. and they came to different parts of, of the country, and the scientists in those places where they came, they started to actually cite the Soviet era research more in those places. And so the idea is that, you know, you can have um, knowledge that's written down in papers. And actually during the Soviet Union, you know, during the Cold War, U.S. scientists had access to these papers. They were actually translated kind of sitting in libraries, um, but people weren't using that knowledge. And what I, kind of, what I show is that, you know, when um, the immigrants came to those places and people start talking, um, then you really see that that knowledge that's kind of, you know, maybe underutilized um, kind of, you know, gets um, diffused and people start using them. And, you know, that happens through uh, immigration. Um, it can also happen through other types of mobility. So, um, you know, conferences or travel, those are other mechanisms, but I'd say, um, immigration, uh, you know, is a, is a big one that characterizes uh, science. In a recent paper um, with um, Ruchir Agarwal, Patrick Gallet, and Jeff Smith, um, we looked at um, another data set of really um, kind of, you know, talented youth. And um, so here we looked at international math Olympiad participants. So these are students who are in high school and they're really, um, you know, kind of like the, the top talent in these countries in high school in terms of math. And they go and they um, compete in in this math Olympiad and then they get a score and so we have a data set of these students and their scores and they're all really good um, what we wanted to look at is we wanted to look at um, you know these really talented mathematicians you know these students in math do they um, go on to then study math contribute to uh, you know mathematical knowledge production um, and what we looked at is who um, left their country and who stayed and what we could see is those who left um, their, their countries to study abroad, particularly in the U.S. So a big part of our um, papers, we show that the U.S. is really, uh, you know, kind of a magnet for talented individuals from around the country and, and you know, for these uh, Math Olympiad participants. Um, well, the ones who came to the U.S. to study and have their kind of talent nurtured, um, they're much more likely to go on to then um, you know, actually do, uh, con you know, create math uh, journal articles and, and contribute to math knowledge that way. Um, whereas the others who didn't um, stay in their home countries, you know, they're so talented that they probably didn't have the opportunity to have that um, knowledge then, you know, kind of cultivated so they could go on. Now, the, what we show in that paper then is that um, uh, we did a survey with some of the, the math Olympiad participants, and we showed that a lot of them who, um, you know, aspired to come to the U.S., so they wanted to actually come and study for college in the U.S., um, but there were still big barriers to them coming. And so the big ones that they mentioned were um, the costs, so financial barriers. So, you know, if you're going to come to the U.S. to do undergrad uh, degree, it's very costly. Um, and then also, yeah, visa barriers, immigration policy. So that's um, another aspect of this. And so what we can see is that in um, some countries like the US, UK, um, there's actually, you know, there's been um, kind of increasing barriers and you can see that then in international students. So I have some work with um, Megan Garvey where we um, are kind of looking at trends in international students um, and kind of who's coming uh, to the U.S. and going to other places. And what you can see is that, you know, in the U.S. it's um, particularly hard to kind of stay and work in the U.S. once you've finished a degree. And um, other countries, so Canada, for example, um, has kind of made it easier for students to stay, although now that's changing. So it's very dynamic, you know, changes. Um, you, the UK, for example, has also kind of made it um, harder for, for students to stay. And um, what you can see then, there's a response. So then you get maybe fewer students um, in the US, for example, we've seen a decline in students from China, um, from India, although it's also increased. But you can see students are responding to this because if you're going to come to a country and study and you start your, your life there and you want to stay and work, um, if, it's, if it's not possible, then that initial decision might be impacted as well. An area that I've started working on recently um, is looking at how war and conflict impacts science. Um, unfortunately, there's been a lot more, you know, been a lot of conflicts that have continued. Um, and so I started to um, 
do some work trying to understand what the impact of um, the full-scale invasion uh, by Russia and Ukraine, uh, the impact that's had on scientists. And, um, you know, it's always challenging to study migration, um, particularly then if you are thinking about a conflict situation. Um, you know, one thing that we, um, I did some work with Fabian Waldinger, a co-author um, on this work uh, in the, the paper War and Science in Ukraine. Um, where, uh, you know, we looked at kind of what are different ways you can actually measure how many scientists have left the country when, um, you know, there was the, the beginning of the war. And um, it's very challenging. How do you measure it? There aren't, you know, surveys suffer from uh, kind of non-response bias and other, you know, you can't find people to give them the survey. Um, one thing that we often do in our research is we use um, data on papers and publications, and then we can see who's migrated by looking at changes in affiliations. Um, when you're looking at the start of the war, for example, um, you know, it takes time for people to publish. Maybe people stop publishing. So how do you actually measure who's left? Um, and so, you know, migration is one thing that happens during war. There's also a mobility of scientists, um, you know, out of science. Maybe they stay in the country, but they stop publishing. Um, and then, unfortunately, yeah, you know, scientists in Ukraine did go and fight. And, and so there's also death um, and trauma from the war. Um, so we um, were kind of, you know, trying to measure how many scientists left, what was the impact on productivity. And it's an important question because we know from other settings, um, particularly from World War II, that um, when a university or a country loses uh, scientists, so if they go abroad, um, it's really hard to recover from that loss of human capital. And then, um, you know, those researchers, when they leave, um, they're not contributing right to, to knowledge being produced. They're also not training the next generation of researchers. So um, it's a real, um, you know, kind of negative impact on the country and its institutions. And so, um, you know, one thing that I've um, been involved in is, is thinking about policies that can counteract those negative impacts, especially in um, cases where, you know, again, there's war, conflict, or economic crises. Um, I uh, also did some work, um, again, at the, after the end of the Soviet Union, where we had a big economic shock, and scientists are leaving the country. They're also leaving science. And one thing that um, that uh, we found, so I showed in this paper called Saving Soviet Science, um, showed that um, even small amounts of money can help a lot, um, you know, in a crisis situation and helping scientists stay in science. And I say, you know, right now, um, the idea is, you know, like in a place like Ukraine, um, having grants for scientists to, um, you know, stay in the country, keep doing science is really important and kind of, you know, helping them continue to, to do their work and also train other scientists. So I'd say, you know, grants um, are a big part of it. Um, international collaboration, so grants particularly that can um, help scientists, uh, you know, kind of work with people abroad. Um, it's also a way for knowledge to, as we talked about earlier, knowledge to diffuse um, so people can kind of stay current and up to, um, you know, what's going on the frontier of knowledge. Um, and then, you know, always immigration policy and visas, the visa policies, those are um, really important as well. And so, you know, thinking about, you know, kind of even short-term exchanges um, can really help in terms of helping people stay engaged and, um, and again, to kind of stay current on what's happening in science. There is this crisis uh, in terms of thinking about mobility and migration um, and, you know, expertise, uh, crisis of, of expertise. And I'd say that um, it's especially important that we think about these issues. I think, you know, scientists have, um, you know, their norms and values and, you know, um, ensuring that um, kind of those communities can kind of stay intact. And I think also, yeah, this... Um, idea of helping more interactions and so you know going to conferences helping people to continue to talk and to exchange ideas is really important um, I'd say with uh, immigration policy yeah we'll see there's a big trend of kind of more restrictions and so um, you know I think one thing that uh, I show you know, showed and, and talked about in this paper um, that I mentioned earlier with the uh, International Math Olympiad participants, um, what you can see is that the U.S. has been a center uh, as attracting talent, but that can change. It can go to a different country. So now, let's say if Australia starts to change its policies and try to attract more people, that uh, center can change. And so, um, so you know, we'll see what, what happens and how things kind of go forward. But, um, you know, uh, things may change. If you look at, um, actually, you know, I was looking at some data on China as, you know, we often think of China as being um, 
uh, we call you know kind of a source country, right? A place that sends um, students and, and scientists abroad. Um, but if you kind of also look at more recent data, it's increasingly a place, a destination. So people from other parts of Asia um, are you know, increasingly going to China and I'd say you know India as well. So we'll see those could also exactly be. Um, you know, turn out to be centers of where, you know, uh, scientists and students are going. Um, China has also had, you know, one policy that is in the mix, too, is returnee programs. And so we know that um, one part, you know, there have been a lot of, as we talked about at the beginning, right, um, where we start out with Nobel Prize winners, um, you know, highly cited scientists who left their countries to do their work abroad, and there have been um, programs to try to incentivize them to come back. So China has a, a famous one, the Thousand Talents Program. Um, now the question is, um, yeah, kind of going forward, then what is that gonna mean for kind of, yeah, like how things start to, to, to play out um, in the end? But I think you're right. I think that they could actually, you know, it could be a destination, an important destination in the future.